Two sisters, one a respected TV producer, Jill Blackstone, and the other, Wendy. She was disabled, nearly blind and deaf, and Jill had devoted herself to taking care of Wendy. Jill was her best friend, her sister, her everything. But the sister bond was shattered when Wendy and some of the sisters' rescue dogs were found dead in a garage next to a toppled over barbecue grill. Jill says accidental carbon monoxide poisoning killed everyone. Police do not believe her. Police arrested Jill Blackstone for the murder of her sister. Investigators think it was staged to look like an accident. Who will you believe, especially now that a secret source has come forward with evidence never made public before? Jill was a good producer. There's no doubt about that. But would she produce murder is the question. Season two of Bad Bad Thing, The Blackstone Sisters, available now wherever you get your podcasts. I always say, show me a perfect family. I'll show you a family with secrets. I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are the prosecutors. Today on The Prosecutors, an amateur filmmaker takes his craft to the extreme when he brings the script to his horror movie to life. But just how far will he go for fame? Everybody and welcome to this episode of The Prosecutors. I'm Brett, and I'm joined, as always, by my terrifyingly awesome co-host, Alice. Hey, Brett. Look who can learn new tricks. Mm. You learned that calling me homely enraged the fan base. Mm, so true. way to turn that word into a compliment. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Though I think terrifying is a compliment, and you are terrifying. All the doers of evil, Alice, are terrified by you. We've all seen you now in action. Everybody who listened to the Add-On episodes has seen you in action and knows they never want to meet you on the wrong side of the V, as you like to say, in a courtroom. So Wrong side of the V. Don't be on the wrong side of the V. My, Let's just say that when I was at CrimeCon and my older kids were at home, all it took was a FaceTime and an indignant mm. stare for them to get their little heinies into line. There you go. Mom is terrifying. See, in my household, it's the opposite. My wife says sometimes that she needs to like record me telling the kids to do various things because she'll like, be trying to get them to do something. And I'm like, hey, do the thing she's saying and she does it. I guess it just depends on, you know, maybe it's because I have a girl who's older and you have two boys, boys. And that's maybe just like the hot dog with the sugar and the. Huh? There you huh? go. You're bringing it you all together. You see those connections? Though no one listening to this, unless Jason puts it in the end, will have any idea what you're talking about. But if you're here for the live, that was a brilliant connection Alice just made. <laughs> Thank so. you for that brilliant connection. You know what? For almost 9 p.m. at night after working 12 hours and not sleeping last night, I think that's a pretty good connection. That's a pretty good connection. Good job, Alice. Okay, well, this is going to be a long one. This is a intense story. There's a lot going on here. If we weren't doing it during the October season, this might be a multi-parter. It may still be a multi-parter. We may end up doing a couple episodes this week, but we'll see. We'll see. I mean, it's a story, so you know, maybe it won't take as long as, as I think it's going to take. But the case we're going to talk about today is the case of Mark Twitchell, aspiring horror movie creator, possible serial killer, depending on who you believe. And this is a case, Alice, that takes us back to Canada. They've done a pretty good number of Canadian cases this year, and we're in what I hear is Canada's greatest city, Edmonton. And I'm sure everyone in Edmonton agrees with me about that, and everyone in Canada. So, no, I'm not saying anything bad about Edmonton, but I have no, heard... No, we, we actually really do love Canada. I mean, it's our our nice brother up north. We actually had a lot of Canadians come to CrimeCon. I was really surprised by that. I would personally like CrimeCon to go to Canada so that we can go to Canada, but that's just me. And you know, so I enjoy Canadian football. I really like watching the Canadian football championship. I can't remember what they call it. I don't know if it has like some fancy name, 
or not. But I feel like my wife and I sometimes will be sitting on the couch looking for something and just randomly the Canadian Football League Super Bowl will be on and we get really into it. So, you know, you know, I like Canada. I've never, well, the only, I've been to Canada, but I've only been to Quebec. So I've never, I've never been to any other part of Canada. I mean, Quebec is awesome. One of my favorite trips that I ever took was right after law school. It was like the week after law school. Instead of leaving campus, you know, we got our diplomas and my best friends and I piled into a car and we drove up the eastern seaboard and went to Prince Edward Island and of Green Gables fame and camped out. I don't even think we had a tent. I literally think we just slept outside in the summer, probably because we had no money <laughs> for for hotel rooms. And it was glorious. I don't remember bugs, no serial killers there. And we read a lot of Anne of Green Gables out loud. So that was like beautiful trip that will probably never be recreated again. Well, the last thing I'll say about Edmonton is go Elks, who are the Canadian football team, and the Oilers. Everybody loves the Oilers. So we're in Edmonton. We're talking about a case that involves a Canadian serial killer. And one thing I've noticed when we talk about Canada is a lot of times the serial killers are actually Americans who end up in Canada. And I always kind of feel bad about that. But this one is a homegrown murderer. So you can't blame us for this guy if you think he actually did it. Because there is some question about that. One thing I want to say, there are a couple books on this case. Devil's Cinema, which is a book written by a journalist and actually Mark Twitchell, who we're going to talk about a lot, collaborated with a journalist. So take that for what you will. I've read the book. It seems pretty straightforward, but it does have input from him. So there may be parts that are shaded a little bit. And then there's also a book called The One Who Got Away. We're going to talk about someone who was involved in a possible attempt on his life and escaped. And he wrote a book as well. So that's one to check out. And a podcast we don't talk about enough, Dark Poutine, which is a Canadian podcast, has covered this case, and just like they do in all their cases, did a great job. We had the honor of being next to them in Las Vegas and really enjoyed hanging out with them. Didn't see them in Orlando. I don't know if they made it to Orlando or not, but hopefully they'll make it to Nashville, and if they do, we will see them there. But okay, Alice, I think that's enough. And for your thematic food, when you watch your movie this Friday, y'all should eat poutine, which is glorious and maybe something we should adopt in America. And thank you for bringing that up, Alice. You know, I'm sure there are many great Canadian horror movies, but I didn't pick a Canadian horror movie for this one. I felt like Scream was close enough, and it's been a really long time since I've seen it, and it's a great movie. So we're watching Scream this Friday. Remember, if you're listening on Patreon, that's the Friday it comes out publicly. So watch that with me. We'll be on Twitter. Probably be around nine o'clock. We'll watch it together. It's a great movie. I'm sure Alice has never seen it. I've never seen it. And instead, on Friday at nine o'clock, those of you who want to join me in eating poutine or just any type of cheese, I'll be there. Awesome. Awesome. Alice will be watching Christmas movies, as she does. As one does. And by the time you hear this, there's only like a week left in October. It makes me very sad. So I hope all of you have enjoyed your October. We'll have more recommendations for various things if you're still in the October spirit that you can check out at the end of this episode. Okay, here we go. Let's move on. We're moving along. So we're starting here with online dating because that's what this case is about in so many ways. And it was a phenomenon that exploded in popularity since its debut in the mid-90s. And the ability to hand-select a potential match combined with a sense of protection from being behind a screen has long appealed to many people. I dare say that most of you out there who are single in the modern world have probably used online dating at some point. But as we all know, there is a darker side to online dating and an inherent danger to meeting strangers online. After all, you never really know who you're talking to. And today, we're going to talk about one of the most terrifying examples of catfishing you're ever going to hear. And that brings us to Johnny Altinger. He was a 38-year-old man living in Edmonton. He was described by his friends as a quiet and affectionate person. He loved technology. He loved motorbikes. He loved his motorcycle. He was an outdoor guy. He played paintball. He was active. He was friendly. He was the kind of guy who, whenever he would message his friends, he always left it with either a nickname or a smiley face or something like that. Somebody who's always trying to bring other people up. I dare say that when he walked in a room, he actually did light it up. And that is absolutely how he's described. And you're going to see just how loyal his friends were to him as we continue with this story. 
But one thing he had not been able to find was love, and he really wanted to find someone that he could settle down with. And so in October of 2008, he signed up on the popular dating site Plenty of Fish, and it was there he met an attractive young woman named Jen. The two hit it off immediately, and they made plans to meet up, a little strangely, at Jen's garage. And if that's throwing up a red flag for you, it probably should, because there was only one problem with Jen. She didn't actually exist. And this is the start of so many fears of all of us women in this modern dating world, where when we go meet up with someone that we meet online, this has now become a meme, right? All of us ladies, we probably text our girlfriends, hey, here's a pin with a map of where I am. And part of the reason we tell our friends that we've arrived at the location to meet someone, maybe even screenshot that person's handle or their profile picture to other women is precisely because of the story you're going to hear now because of the dangers of online dating and potentially meeting someone who is not who they claim to be. Because when Johnny arrived at the meeting place, so excited to meet this Jen he'd been talking to for some time. He was attacked and brutally murdered by Mark Twitchell, a Dexter-obsessed aspiring filmmaker. Johnny's murder was eerily similar to the plot of Twitchell's own short horror film, House of Cards. In the years that would follow, investigators would find shocking evidence of Twitchell's depravity, his serial killer aspirations, and his desire to be the real-life Dexter Morgan. Here, film was meeting real life. And you know, it's interesting because one thing that Dark Poutine points out about Mark Twitchell is how he had no authenticity to himself. There's some question about, is he a psychopath, is he not? He, we're going to talk about something he wrote later on. But he certainly doesn't seem to have any core. Dark Poutine called him the hollow man, which I think is a, a great description of him because everything he did was a copy of something else. He, he made films, but they always tended to be a copy. His most famous thing he did was a Star Wars fan film. And now he's trying to build this copy of Dexter. But it's obviously a poor copy because if you've ever watched Dexter, Dexter didn't kill innocent people. Dexter killed bad people. That was the whole conceit of the show. So clearly he missed something. But as we go through this story, you're going to see that that what drove him truly was this dark obsession to be a monster. And, and that is why he was doing the things he was doing. And there's something kind of even, even scarier, Brett, about someone who's a copycat monster rather than it be inherent within them. Like something happened in their childhood or something, you know, something went wrong in their DNA and they just are a monster and all of that monsterness just pours out. That almost seems like you can explain that. There's, there's an errant person, right? They're not like the rest of us. But when you have a copycat monster, for some reason, that is so much more creepy to me because they're studying something to become that. The concept of him being a hollow man and adopting, you know, the worst parts of what he's watching is terrifying to me because all of us, you guys are here listening to a story love storytelling. And when those people who are these copycasts of monsters are absorbing all of these stories to become their own, everything around them has the potential of feeding the monster, which is, you know, what we're doing now could potentially be doing that. So we're going to start in October 2008, October 3rd, and we're actually not going to start with Johnny Altlinger. We're going to start with someone who the only reason I'm going to pronounce their name correctly is because I did listen to Dark Poutine because it looks like Giles Tetralt. That is not how you pronounce his name. His name is Jill Tetro. I think that's pretty close. So Jill Tetro, he was doing the same thing that Johnny was doing. He was looking for love and he met a seemingly normal woman named Sheena through an online dating site. I believe the same one. And from her profile, she appeared to be happy, she was attractive, she was blonde, and he was thrilled when she suggested that they meet up for a date. Sheena would not give Jill an address, which is, you know, which should be a red flag, but what's really interesting about this case is we're reversing the genders, right? So we have men who are being lured to something instead of women. I would think your average woman if she was on a dating side and she met somebody and they wanted to meet and and the person wouldn't give them an address only gives them sort of vague directions that lead to a garage. Most women, 
and this is me being sexist, are smart enough to probably be like, that's a problem. But guys didn't don't even think about it. <laughs> Just like, oh, someone likes me? Well, I'm coming to the garage then. And that's what you have happen here. But kind of flipping that, Brett, flipping that, right? Not only is the guy thinking, you know, the, the fear of a woman is probably less than a woman meeting a man who could probably physically overcome her. He's also thinking... Oh, she's being very safe. She's not going to give me an address right now just in case I can track it in case I'm the serial killer and I'm the crazy person because we all know the dangers of the Internet and dating for women. We all know the statistics on domestic violence. So she's just being cautious. I understand that, which is incredibly, you know, twisted here. And so Alice is giving all you men out there the benefit of the doubt. So we're going to take that. We're going to take that and run with it. That's exactly what it was. So. He gets the directions and he goes to the garage. But when he arrives there, it becomes clear that something's not right. Number one, the garage door is not all the way open. It's just open just far enough that he can sort of duck inside. And when he ducks inside, Sheena's nowhere in sight. But what he does see is a man wearing a gold and black hockey mask. Which, if you're either watching this on YouTube or if you've seen the art that the amazing Hannah Hill did, this is what she picked, is the hockey mask. And it is terrifying. <laughs> but, once again, copycat, can't do anything original, hockey mask, made famous in the Friday the 13 movies by Jason Voorhees. And that's what he's seeing. He's seeing this black and gold hockey mask. And the man attacks Jill. And, in fact, he grabs him and strikes him with a stun gun. So, Jill, he tries to fight back, but the man pulls out a gun and orders him to the ground. And at first, he complies. He's got a gun on him. He's falling to his knees. He's complying. And at that point, the man pulls out duct tape and starts wrapping around Jill's eyes. And it's, it's at this point where something very interesting happened. And if you read his book, he talks about this. He thought to himself... I am probably going to die here. This person is going to murder me. And if they're going to murder me, I'm going out on my own terms. So while the other person is distracted, I guess putting up the duct tape, Jill jumps up, rips the duct tape off of his eyes, turns and faces his attacker and tells him, you're not going to do this to me. I'm not going down like this. At this point, for a second, his attacker's kind of stunned, but then he pulls the gun out and points it at Jill, but when he does this for the first time, he really looks at the gun and he realizes it's a fake. It's not a real firearm. In fact, it's like a BB gun. And this gives him even more strength to struggle. Well, they get in a in a fight, in a big fight. The man is strong. He's still got the stun gun. He's hitting him with something, which Jill's not even sure what it is. But at some point, the man grabs him by his jacket, and Jill's able to slip out of the jacket, like something in a movie, run away. He stumbles to the ground, rolls out of the garage, and manages to sort of limp down the road. Once again, like in a horror movie, the man comes out of the garage, coming after him. But then, right at the right minute, a couple walking a dog walks into the alleyway and they see Jill laying on the ground. And he says, I've been attacked. Somebody attacked me. At which point the man who had attacked him walks up, still wearing the mask. He looks at the couple. He looks at Jill and says, come on, Frank. As if they were just friends involved in some sort of really weird game. He says, come on, Frank. What are you doing? turns around and walks away back towards the garage. Well, the couple thinks, this is the weirdest thing we've ever seen. I don't know what weird games you guys are playing, but we're getting out of here. But fortunately, whoever it was, was also, I guess, freaked out. And so he just walks back to the garage, leaving Jill laying in the middle of the alleyway, barely able to stand because he's been stunned multiple times and been struck by something. He manages to get up, make his way to the truck that he drove there in and get away. He survived the attack, but his ego was horribly bruised. And we have talked about this before. I think we talked about this when we talked about the Lady Vanishes and how when people get taken advantage of in situations like this, oftentimes they're so embarrassed and they feel so stupid that rather than going to the police... They just take their losses and move on with their lives. And that's exactly what Jill does. He's ashamed of what happened, and he decides, you know what? I'm not going to report this incident to the police. 
Probably the guy just wanted to mug me. This was a mugging gone wrong, and he just moves on with his life. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Can we all just take a breath? Because that was, I was holding my breath through that entire altercation. I mean, for sure, Jill was going to die if he did not fight back. And I can't believe he was able to have his wits about him to first decide he was not going to go down this way and then to actually have the wherewithal to recognize that the gun was not real before fighting back. And, you know, the the comment by his attacker to the couple, you know, Frank, what you doing? Walking away is chilling to my core, probably somehow more chilling than all of the violent stuff that he's done up until that point, because you can imagine this is a massive altercation. It did not go as the attacker planned, right? His Jill was supposed to just lay down and take it literally, right? He had a gun. He was complying. He had wrapped duct tape around his eyes. All of a sudden, his victim is fighting back. And so the attacker's adrenaline is also in immensely high, but he's able to have that cool psychopathic ability to twist the situation and talk calmly to basically get out of the situation and have the couple not call the police. And I find that so chilling because it goes to the core of who this attacker is. And then we move on. Not too long after Jill was attacked. In fact, just one week later, on October 10th, 2008, Johnny, who we started our story with, connects with a woman named Jen on PlentyOfFish.com. Similar to Jill, Johnny made plans to meet up with Jen at a garage in Edmonton. You hear different things, but Johnny either, because he was wary of the date or because his friends were, actually sent one of his friends Dale Smith's directions to the garage. So not unlike the situation that I told you earlier that me and my girlfriends do. Basically saying, hey, I'm going to be somewhere. Here's where I'm going to be. So somebody else knows where Johnny is going. And Dale, by the way, is immediately like, that sounds really weird. <laughs> that whole setup sounds really strange. This is like directions to a garage thing. You know, I don't know about this, but... Johnny, once again, excited about the date, just sort of ignores the concerns of his friend that will only grow as this story goes on. And now, like we said, Johnny's really excited to meet Jen. So he doesn't play it cool. He doesn't try to roll into this date late. In fact, he gets there 30 minutes early. And when he arrives at the garage, kind of a similar situation. It's not fully open. It's not lit up. It's kind of, you know, with the door lowered down. So he does what anyone would do to get into the garage. He ducks in. And into the darkened garage, and much like Jill, he looks around, and he doesn't see Jen. He doesn't see any woman, in fact. Instead, there was a man in the garage. And interestingly, the man who was in the garage appeared to be surprised to see Johnny. He actually talked to Johnny. He said, hey, I'm a filmmaker, and he had a fake gun. And this man told Johnny that he was making a movie, but that Jen wasn't there yet and that Johnny would need to come back later. Remember, Johnny's there early. So Johnny said he'd do just that. No problem. I'll be back later. We know all this because Johnny called Dale after he left the garage to say, hey, got there early. There was this guy there. He's making a movie. But Jen's not there yet, so I'm going to go back in about half an hour. And about an hour later, Johnny texted Dale that Jen was home now and he was going back. And Dale, by the way, is like, what in the world are you talking about? There was a guy there making a horror movie with a fake gun. What in the world? Like you show up at the garage and that's what you find and you don't find her. But he is, he's convinced it's going to be fine. And in fact, he had been told there might be a guy there. Like you might see a guy, you know, he hangs out there. He works on movies. Sometimes this story is elevated a little bit in the creepiness factor that he rolls into the garage or he steps in the garage and the walls are covered in plastic and there's a table in the middle and it's covered in plastic and the guy's standing in front of the table. And that obviously is what Dexter would do. It sounds like that is not right. I think that is a little bit of embellishment. It sounds like Twitchell, who we're going to talk about a lot, he may very well have had a room like that that was covered in plastic, but this wasn't. The garage wasn't that way. So it wasn't that. I mean, it was still pretty freaky, but I mean, if you walked into that, 
and said, oh, yeah, I'll be back. I mean, I don't think anybody would do that. As a matter of fact, later on, the police are going to do luminol test in this room, and they're going to find a huge pool of blood right in the middle of it. The whole point of having the plastic is so the blood doesn't get all over there everywhere, which indicates there is no plastic. So to the extent you've heard that part of the story, I don't think that's true. But it seems pretty clear that him showing up 30 minutes early, it could have saved his life because he wasn't ready. Mark wasn't ready for him when he showed up. And so he sort of gives him this song and dance and sends him away. But we talked about that book sometimes, The Gift of Fear, which a lot of people read. And apparently Johnny just didn't feel that. He didn't feel afraid. In fact, when he texted Dale later on, and Dale didn't see the text until the next day. And when he texted him later on, he ended his text with hee hee. He's like, she's back. I'm going to go back. Hee hee. So he's like, he's still very excited. He's to giddy. Go. He's giddy. He's still very excited. You know who has the gift of fear? This girl. <laughs> <laughs> it is a good thing to I'm have. Not I'm not kidding about that. And you, you're really, you're really right about this, though. It's so fascinating. If this is not like the poster child for why you should be early in life, I don't know what is. Right? Like he clearly was not ready for Johnny to arrive early, and so he had to make up the story and send him away. And gosh darn it, Johnny, why didn't you pick up on the cues? I know. Darkened, uh, you know, darkened garage with like the door half open and a fake gun, like real gun, fake gun. I don't care. I'm not. I'm not gonna think this is a really fun situation to come back to so he ends that text with he he a couple days pass a few days pass october 13th several of johnny's friends and family members receive an identical email from johnny and it read hey there i've met an extraordinary woman named jen who has offered to take me on a nice long tropical vacation we'll be staying in her winter home in costa rica phone number to follow soon I won't be back in town until December 10th, but I will be checking my email periodically. See you around the holidays. Johnny, if you ever receive an email like this from me, Brett, you better go looking for me. <laughs> oh, I absolutely will. I and absolutely if you will. do not, you are not a good friend. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I will. mean, and, and, and it reads just like that, including typos, right? Okay, so let's just, for a second, obviously this is a strange email, but... Let's assume that your friends are getting this email, friends and family. The exact same email doesn't say anyone's name, right? Doesn't say, hey, Dale, says, hey there. And this extraordinary woman who he met days ago, literally days ago, is now going to give him a two month long vacation in her glorious vacation home in Costa Rica. And wonderfully, the phone number is not in this particular email, but don't you worry, it's going to follow. And I'll see you in December. See you for the holidays. Can't wait for Christmas. Just going to skip through Halloween is what this email says. Now, strange email coupled with the fact that actually Johnny had stopped showing up for work and in fact had resigned from work by email. Let friends... Thank God these friends picked up on these cues and they did have the gift of fear or at least the gift of skepticism to report Johnny missing. Law enforcement didn't initially take this inquiry very seriously. And unfortunately, you're going to know this, but Edmonton leads the country for the number of murders. So they have a lot on their plate and the police, without any evidence of a crime, there seems to be communication from this man. And other than wanting to quit his job, which might be strange, but people quit jobs all the time. The police just didn't have the resources to devote to this investigation of a person who may or may not have had a crime committed against him. And you can imagine how this conversation went. My friend's missing. OK, well, that sounds serious. What happened? Well, we got an email that says he met a woman and they've gone off on a trip. Okay. Was he looking for a girlfriend? Well, yeah, he was on an online dating app and he had met someone the night before. I mean, you can imagine how the police would look at that, right? They would think, this sounds like maybe you're overreacting. And we talk about this a lot. These cases where it turns out you're not overreacting, a lot of times, initially, the police think this is run of the mill. This is going to be like just every other case. But in the, this case, it turns out not to be so. A few more days pass. Johnny doesn't come back. He doesn't reach out to his friends and family. And his friends are becoming more concerned. And they notice things about those emails. They didn't end with the happy-go-lucky hee-hees or ha's. No emojis, no smiley faces. One of his friends he always called Sunshine. And he didn't call her that in the email he sent to her. And so they are really concerned. And so they go to his apartment. And one of the first things they see is his motorcycle. And it's parked there, but it's not covered. And that was entirely unlike Johnny. He loved his bike and he would never have left it like that for any period of time, certainly not for months. 
They go to his apartment, they knock on the door, there's no answer. So they kind of fool around and they find a window that's unlocked. So they open it up, they boost one of the women through the door, she goes through, unlocks the door, and the rest of them come in. The apartment appeared normal, but it certainly didn't look packed up for a, a two-month vacation. There's still dirty dishes, for instance, in the sink, which, I mean, Johnny's a bachelor, so maybe that doesn't mean so much. But there was one big problem. They found his passport in his bedroom. And remember, the whole story that was being told to them was he was going to Costa Rica on a vacation for two months. How could he have done that without a passport. And the only things that appeared to be missing were the things that he would have needed to go meet this woman, his wallet, his car keys, and his car, a red Mazda 6. So at this point, they go back to the police, and now the police understand this is more serious. They give the police a copy of the directions to the garage that Johnny had given them earlier. The police go down to the garage, and and they discover that it was rented to a 29-year-old aspiring filmmaker, Mark Twitchell. And in fact, he had rented the space to film his short movie, House of Cards, which tells the story of a killer who lured men to a garage and murdered them. Probably not the best cover if you're actually going to do that, but nevertheless, that was the story of the short film he was making. So investigators, they reach out to Mark, they contact him, he agrees to come unlock the garage. However, when he arrives, he claims someone has changed the padlock on the garage and he doesn't have the key. Officers break the lock, they open up the garage, but they don't see any sign of Johnny, they don't have a warrant, they don't really have permission to search, so they sort of, you know, do a brief look and then leave. They do ask Mark if he'll come down to the police station for the questioning, he says sure, he's very cooperative, very open to all this. And he told the police that he'd been using the garage as a set for his short thriller film, but it was not currently in use because he was working on another film. And he sort of indicated that there might have been other people who had access to the garage and could have been in and out of it. And this seemed to be confirmed by the fact that this padlock that was on the garage was not his. And he said, look, someone must have broken in and in a really weird thing. I don't know why anybody would do this. They must have changed the lock. So that is the story that he tells them. So now, a couple days pass by on October 19th. The police are informed that their search warrant request for Twitchell's garage had been denied due to a lack of evidence that a crime had been committed. Guys, I know we're in a different country and a different justice system here, but we've always told you that it, it isn't necessary. It is not a rubber stamp to get a search warrant. There does have to be probable cause and a judge is supposed to look at it with a discerning eye. And then then this in this instance, the judge looked at it and was like, yeah, I really don't see that there's any evidence of a crime here other than that Dale had directions to this place. But you, you haven't indicated that there's any tie to some sort of crime. And so the police actually ask Mark if he would consent to a search of the garage. And to their surprise, but really not to ours, those discerning listeners who know, what does Mark do? He agrees and consents to a search. We say this all the time. The people, <laughs> we said this yesterday, in fact, during our other recording. When people have something to hide, Oftentimes, they consent to a search. I don't know. Someone who's a psychologist can study this. We see this in our cases all the time when people just have like a ton of drugs in their car during a traffic stop where there's absolutely no probable cause for a search. And the police is like, hey, can I search your car? And they're like, yes, absolutely. And what did the police find? A lot of illegal substances. Well, here we have Mark saying, man, your search warrant got denied. But yes, absolutely. Come search. And guess what? They don't need a search warrant now. He can consent to the search, which he does right now. Now, when the police go inside the garage, they noticed some things. They saw cleaning supplies, the smell of burning, and what might have been blood. Mark explained that as a filmmaker, he'd recently filmed a scene using fake blood. Already, by the way, if you're following the story... Remember just a little bit earlier, he said that he was working on another film and that it'd been so long really since he'd been to this garage that someone had broken in and even changed the locks. But now that the police are in there and seeing things that are a little bit, you know, questionable, the smell of burning, blood. Now Mark is saying, well, I just shot a scene and it needed some fake blood. That's what you're seeing. So when an officer picked up Mark in order to perform this search, Mark told the officer an interesting story about how he had recently purchased a red Mazda from a man for just $40, something that 
Mark hadn't previously mentioned to the police. Mark goes on to say that a man approached him saying he was looking to sell his car as he and his wealthy girlfriend would be leaving on a trip shortly. And since all Mark had on him was $40, they agreed on that price. And so I hope every one of you who thinks that if Richard Allen did the Delphi murders, there's no way he would have gone to the resource officer and said he was there. Yes, he would have. Just like Mark Twitchell, who can't keep from telling officers things in the in an effort to cover up his possible involvement in this crime. Oh, you found out that I had this vehicle? Well, I bought it for $40. Oh, you think you see blood? Well, we just filmed a, a scene here and used fake blood. We burned some things. I mean, he's... You know, he thinks he's being clever. He thinks he's getting in front of this. But in fact, he's just making the police more and more suspicious. And he's giving them more and more of that probable cause that they didn't have in the beginning to search various places. On October 21st, they get a warrant to search Mark's Maroon Pontiac Grand Am. And the forensic team, they really make out this time. They uncover the key to Johnny's Mazda, a series of sticky notes littered across the car, one of which was a map to Johnny's condo, and another a note that said kill room clean sweep. They also found a Dexter novel and a receipt for a hockey mask. Most damning, they found a military blade with what appeared to be blood stains in a backpack in the car, a large red stain in the trunk, and a steak knife with suspected blood stains in the wheel well. Finally, they uncovered a laptop which eventually they got a search warrant for that as well. And they recovered a deleted Word document titled SK Confessions from this laptop. SK Confessions, which prosecutors would later argue stood for Serial Killer Confessions, was a 42-page document written by Twitchell that detailed, according to Murderpedia, the, quote, extensive planning failed first attempt and successful second attempt at murdering a man by luring him to his garage using fake online dating profiles. It also described the process of dismembering the victim's body and numerous attempts to dispose of the remains, including by attempting to burn them. Twitchell is going to have to deal with this later on in trial. He's going to argue this is a screenplay. It's not a confession. He just was writing a movie that happened to line up perfectly with what the police would later discover was both an attempt, an initial attempt to commit this crime and then a successful attempt with Johnny. And the police obviously are not believing that this is a diary. Can we just say that there's nothing new under the sun? So I think if you guys are watching the news right now, there is the case of Corey Richens, the woman who is uh, charged with murdering her husband with fentanyl, like giving him a cocktail drink with so much fentanyl that it could have killed, you know, I think several people. And she has, I think the most recent controversy is she was found with a letter that purported to coach her family members how to lie on the stand or how to lie about their testimony to make her seem innocent. And what did she say when that letter was found? Ah, this was not me trying to tamper with witnesses or suborn perjury. No, no, no. This is a novel that I'm writing. So just so you know, this happens. This happens currently day. And this is what Mark is trying to do now. On October 24th, there is just like a mountain of evidence going on from his own mouth, from everything they're finding, from the consent of the search, from searches that are coming from search warrants now, because now there actually is evidence of a crime, a lot of evidence of a crime. The forensic team arrives at the garage that's rented by Mark Twitchell with a search warrant. Remember first time? Denied. Not this time. Upon entry, the team spotted storage shelves, which house the following. Duct tape black handcuffs, which unlocked with a key that was found in Twitchell's home, garbage bags, a fake handgun, a juice jug containing a sticky red substance, a stun gun, and a metal pipe covered in blood. The team also found several other items spotted with blood, a metal table with the edges stained in blood, a steak knife, a bloody tooth fragment, an oil drum, and cleaning supplies. This is literally straight out of Dexter. Yeah, I mean, he has <laughs> he has taken his Dexter obsession and made it real life. And now brings us to Halloween, October 31st. Mark Twitchell woke up on Halloween morning eager to finish making his Iron Man costume for that evening's Halloween Howler, the city's largest Halloween party. 
However, Mark would not make it to the Haller this year because as he was walking to a coffee shop that very morning, he was arrested for the first degree murder of Johnny. The blood that had been found in Mark's car 10 days prior had been confirmed to belong to Johnny Altinger. And a couple months later, in December of 2008, Twitchell pleads not guilty to first-degree murder. Angie has made it easier than ever to connect with skilled professionals to get all your home projects done well. If you own a home, you know how much work it can take. Whether it's everyday maintenance and repairs or making dream projects a reality, it can be hard just to know where to start. But now, all you need to do is Angie that and find a skilled local pro who will deliver the quality and expertise you need. And Alice, you can turn to Angie with confidence no matter what the size of your home or the size of your project. Whether you've got a 100-year-old house like I do where it seems like things are always breaking or if you're renting and you're needing someone to help you with moving moving, installations, or cleaning, Angie is there for you, and they're there for you with confidence. So, Angie has over 20 years of home service experience, and they've combined it with new tools to simplify the whole process. Bring them your project online or with Angie's app, answer a few questions, and Angie can handle the rest from start to finish. Or, they can help you compare quotes from multiple pros and connect instantly which means you can take care of just about any home project in just a few taps because when it comes to getting the most out of your home you can do this when you angie that download the free angie mobile app today or visit angie.com that's a-n-g-i.com check them out today angie.com a-n-g-i.com Guys, we're so excited to talk again about HelloFresh. So many of you have told us that you've joined the HelloFresh family and you love it. And that doesn't surprise me at all because with HelloFresh, you're getting farm fresh pre-portioned ingredients, seasonal recipes. They're easy and fun to make and they are delicious too. You guys have a crazy schedule, so do we. It can make it hard to eat good food. It can make it hard to cook nice things for your family. And you can get yourself in a rut. That's where HelloFresh comes in. With so many in-season ingredients, you'll taste all the freshness of fall in every bite of HelloFresh's chef-crafted recipes. Produce travels from the farm to your door for peak ripeness you can taste. Brett. This week has just been uniquely crazy for me between podcasts and work and just it seems like I can't get to the store. I don't have time to cook. Enter HelloFresh. Just yesterday, I was running from one meeting to the next and I was thinking, what am I going to cook? I opened my front door and there was HelloFresh and one of my favorite meals was in it. The street tacos. Even my toddler can help me cook it. It takes about 20 minutes and it is absolutely spectacular. The boys were ooing and eyeing as I put it on the table, and before it even got cool, everyone had gobbled it up. I have to tell you guys, if you are looking for just incredible meals to your doorstep, HelloFresh is the way to go. Go to HelloFresh.com slash 50TP and use code 50TP for 50% off plus free shipping. Go to HelloFresh.com slash 50TP and use code 50TP for 50% off plus free shipping and find out why HelloFresh is America's number one meal kit. The Prosecutor's Podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Most of you listening right now are probably multitasking. Yep, while you're listening to us talk, you're probably also driving, cleaning, exercising, or maybe even grocery shopping. But if you're not in some kind of moving vehicle, there's something else you can be doing right now. Getting an auto quote from Progressive Insurance. It's easy and you could save money by doing it right from your phone. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save nearly $750 on average. And auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Discounts for having multiple vehicles on your policy, being a homeowner, and more. So just like your favorite podcast, Progressive will be with you 24-7, 365 days a year. So you're protected no matter what. Multitask right now. Quote your car insurance at Progressive.com to join the over 28 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates, national average 12-month savings of $744 by new customers surveyed who save with Progressive between June 2022 and May 2023. Potential savings will vary. Discounts not available in all states and situations. And by this time, Jill has also come forward and told the police what happened to him. Mark will also be charged with attempted murder 
but that charge will eventually just sort of go away for for reasons it'll become obvious once we continue to talk through what happened so july 24 2009 so fast forward to the next year his bond request which he asked for is denied which is not all that surprising and in September, and I don't really understand how Canadian law works, to be frank with you, but there's sort of an argument whether or not they need to have a preliminary hearing. I guess in Canada, you can decide to skip the preliminary hearing and move straight to trial. So that is what they decide to do. On June 3rd, 2010, which is nearly two years after Johnny Altinger was murdered, Mark Twitchell will request a meeting with law enforcement. When the two detectives arrive at the meeting, he hands them a folded piece of paper. And it is a Google map printout with handwritten instructions to a sewer grate where Johnny Altinger's remains were hidden. Now, you may think that Mark is, is confessing, but he's actually far cleverer than that, which you're going to see in a second. The police, they follow his instructions. They go to the manhole. They open it up. And when they turn their flashlight on, they can see at the bottom of the manhole what appear to be human remains. So the next day on June 4th, police returned to the scene with the medical examiner and the forensic team. And when they entered the sewer, they found a human torso, pelvic bone, kneecap, and a tooth. The bones that they were able to recover, quote, showed signs of cutting, breaking, and sawing. Testing confirmed that these bones belonged to Johnny Altinger. When Twitchell initially requested the meeting with law enforcement, he laid out specific conditions that had to be met prior to the meeting, one of which was secrecy, so the public was not made aware of the discovery of Johnny's remains. And for what it's worth, the police did tell his parents and his family that they had found Johnny's body, but for now, this remains secret, and, and this is... An interesting part of Canadian jurisprudence, it comes up in this case. In the United States, obviously, as we've learned, it's, you know, you can have gag orders, but usually things become public pretty fast. In Canada, it seems like they have a little bit more power to keep things secret. So fast forward to March 16th, 2011. Twitchell's trial begins. Now, look, they found all this evidence. He's told them where to find the body, which has been all cut up. You feel like this seems like it's heading to... A guilty plea. What exactly could his defense possibly... I mean, maybe insanity, right? But no, no, no. That's not what he does. He pleads not guilty to the charge of first-degree murder, but then, to the shock of everyone in the courtroom, he asked for permission to plead guilty to the charge of improperly interfering with a dead human body. Now, the Crown prosecutor does not consent to this alternate plea, and so they proceed on the charge of first-degree murder, but this is a hint about what his defense is going to be. Now, the prosecution, their argument is pretty straightforward. Twitchell, he lured Altinger to his garage where he brutally attacked him, murdered him, and then dismembered him. Their case was based on the idea that Twitchell had replicated the plot of his short film, House of Cards, which we've talked about, into real life. And Twitchell becomes the murderer, and Johnny is the victim. And they claimed that, he, that Twitchell viewed himself as some sort of corrupted form of Dexter Morgan. Twitchell was absolutely obsessed with Dexter, and no one denied that, though he'll later claim it was overstated. He went so far as to create a Facebook profile pretending to be Dexter Morgan, and while the room where this happened, the garage where this happened, wasn't a kill room, apparently there was a room in that building that looked like the kill room from the Dexter television show, the one covered with plastic and everything else. And obviously, the story that he was writing, the film he wanted to make, seemed to be based on Dexter. And the prosecution, look, they have a mountain of evidence. We talked about how much evidence they had, and it all pointed to the fact that Mark had definitely killed Johnny. And Twitchell didn't deny this. In fact, he said he had killed him. But he claimed that it was an act of self-defense. And this is a long trial because there is a lot of evidence. I mean, the prosecution goes on for about three weeks. And on April 6, 2011, the defense begins their case. Twitchell, this is always, everyone is like, what's going to happen is when the defense puts on their case, is the defendant going to take the stand? 
you do not have to take the stand, but Twitchell takes the stand and he is about to tell his story. He admitted to luring Johnny Altinger to the garage, but he claimed that he did this as some sort of publicity stunt to promote his upcoming short film, House of Cards. In Twitchell's version of events, he didn't intend on killing Johnny, but Johnny became enraged when Twitchell told him that this was just a stunt and Jen was not real. And Johnny was so mad about being catfished that an altercation broke out. He went on to say that Johnny was the one who grabbed a pipe and began swinging at Mark. Twitchell was able to get the pipe away from Johnny and in self-defense, he hit Johnny in the head. But Johnny wasn't going to go down. Johnny got the pipe back. He was a crazed maniac. He wanted love. And here he was being made to look a fool. So Johnny grabs the pipe back, at which point Mark is afraid for his life, he says. So he grabs a knife and stabbed Johnny right below his sternum, killing him. Mark then said that he moved Johnny's body to the table in his garage kill room and dismembered his body. Several days later, Mark attempted to burn Johnny's remains, but when that didn't work, he put the remains in a sewer drain. So he's basically, I mean, this is smart in the sense that he doesn't dispute any of the evidence. He's giving his version of events based on the exact same set of evidence. And this is very smart because we often see defendants just try to deny things like there was no blood. That's not my fingerprint when they're undeniable. These facts are undeniable. So instead, he is telling a story, an alternate story to fit the facts that the prosecution has presented. And let me just say, somewhere in Canada, somebody believes this story. <laughs> somewhere in Canada, somebody's like, man, poor Mark Twitchell. He was an innocent man just defending himself. There's probably a podcast arguing that he was innocent. But when you when you see this story, I mean, look, it's it's clever, right? Like the whole idea is he's going to make this movie, he's going to release it, and then all these people are going to come out of the woodwork. It's kind of like Blair Witch, and they're going to say, that actually happened to me. Like Jill's going to come out and say, that exact thing happened to me. I went to a place and I was attacked by a guy just like in the movie. And Johnny was going to do the same thing. And that's how this this was going to work. It was like viral marketing before viral marketing was cool. I mean, if he was really doing this, he would be way ahead of his time because that was 2008, right? That's how he was going to do that. And that's his argument. There's some problems with this, <laughs> not the least of which is going to be Jill's story about how, you know, he used a stun gun on him and pointed a gun at him and wrapped duct tape around really his head. And really hurt him. And really hurt him. <laughs> and the other problem is going to be the whole SK Confessions thing, which has come in. Right. So, Mark's defense spent much of their time, understandably, trying to persuade the jury that this SK Confessions, remember that had been deleted from the computer but was recovered using electronic forensics, was not a full confession. No, of course not. It was just a dramatization that was intended to shock the reader. They went on to emphasize that it was impossible to know what truly happened in the garage that evening, but... It was an act of self-defense. The best story wins, Brett. And they are putting up a story for sure. They are not just letting the evidence speak for themselves. They are certainly presenting their own story. And look, this is in some ways the perfect encapsulation of what some people fall for with the whole reasonable doubt thing. How can we know? What happened? Maybe that is what happened. That's a plausible alternative scenario. How can we know for sure? And that's a great example of the wrong definition of reasonable doubt, by the way. A lot of people think reasonable doubt means can any other story fit the evidence that the prosecution was showing? No matter how unbelievable it is or how unlikely it is or that I just park my rational critical thinking skills over there while I listen to a story. If you can tell me any story, even if I have to suspend 20 different types of reality in order to accept it, it's a story that could be told and therefore that must mean reasonable doubt. No, that's not reasonable doubt. You still get to use your own rational thinking as to whether that could have happened. So that takes us to April 11th, 2011. 
case comes to a close, and it's now both sides' time to give a closing statement. The defense sticks to this story. They say, look, this was a publicity stunt gone wrong. This was an act of self-defense after Johnny became enraged. You know, what's interesting about Johnny becoming enraged is usually you can't use character evidence in a case, but actually here you probably could. This is an evidence aside. If you want to claim something like this, that someone became enraged in a certain circumstance, you could put on a bunch of evidence that that wasn't his character, that he wasn't the kind of person who got enraged. Now, I think his friends probably would testify to that. I don't know if that happened in this case, but just an aside of how character evidence sometimes can come in. Usually you can't use it initially, but when someone's a character is When someone's character is attacked, then all of a sudden you can bring it in. And sort of part of this defense involves attacking the character of the victim and saying, no, they were the aggressor. They were aggressive. And that's their argument. And they say, look, this guy's a filmmaker. He made several movies and he had. And he... He was constantly working on that sort of stuff. And SK Confessions is a script. Twitchell freaked out. This went horribly wrong. He freaked out. He killed in self-defense this poor man. And he knew if he goes to the police, what are they going to do? They're going to do exactly what they did. Think he murdered him. That's the approach they're going to take. And so instead, he dismembers the body. In some ways, this is almost the Murdaugh argument, right? That Murdaugh lied about the video because he didn't trust the police. He had such a deep mistrust of the police, of which he was a part, that he just had to lie about the video. And this is similar here. Mark is saying, look, I was terrified of what would happen, and so I did I did do this horrible thing, which I'm willing to plead guilty to. Abused a body. He cut up the body, and he disposed of it. The prosecution rejects this across the board. They say this was a planned and deliberate murder. They point to the evidence that had previously been presented, linking Twitchell to the crime, the evidence that Jill had testified to, the fact that he had done this twice, the fact that it matched the script so perfectly. You have a script where you're luring someone to this place to murder them, and this person ended up dead after you lured them to the place. And they said, look, it's not a script, it's a confession. And they pointed to various lies Twitchell had told, some of which we've talked about, which obviously the defense is going to say that was just part of him being concerned about, you know, what's going to happen to me if the police look at me. But that is the argument the prosecution is making. Trust your gut. Trust your instincts. Look at the evidence. And so after closing arguments, the jury goes to deliberate the next day on April 12th, and they deliberate for five short hours, and they're ready to deliver a verdict. Mark Twitchell was found guilty of first-degree murder. By the way, Brett and I tell you guys this all the time. When the jury deliberates for a very short amount of time, and remember, this was like a month-long trial, a very long trial. When the jury deliberates for a short amount of time, it typically means it's good for the prosecution. And it, that happens to be the case here. And, and, and Mark was sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole for 25 years. He was only 31 years at the time of sentencing. And shortly following the guilty verdict, Mark tried to appeal, claiming that media attention had unfairly influenced the jury. But the next year, in March of 2012, he withdrew his appeal. By the way, do you know what his argument was on appeal? Media attention unfairly influenced the jury. Again, all our worlds are colliding right now, Brett, but (laughs) obviously we had recently talked about the filing in the Delphi case where Richard Allen, the defendant, asked to have cameras in the courtroom. And part of the argument by the prosecution was pointing out how the media could essentially make this a circus. And one of the concerns we pointed out you know, that's not in the filing is that when there's a media circus, there's a potential for mistrial. There's a potential for a kind of unduly influencing jurors who should not see that sort of material or anyone in the courtroom. A lot of things can go wrong when every single, you know, breath that anyone takes in the courtroom is being blasted across 24 hour network news. Now, Mark is currently housed at the Saskatchewan Federal Penitentiary in Prince Albert, Canada. And while he is serving his time right now, pretty soon he's going to be eligible for parole in about 13 more years, in 2036. And all you ladies out there, apparently he already has a dating profile indicating he'll be ready for his first date in 2037. And if that's not evidence that Canada needs to reconsider its sentencing structure, which I understand the Supreme Court, for reasons that aren't clear, said that life without parole is cruel and unusual. It's not. And certainly, maybe 
maybe you could up the number of years past 25 because Mark Twitchell, when, if he gets out of prison in 2036, he's not going to be that old. 56 years old. There's plenty of people who murder people when they're 56 years old. And this man is a dangerous person. And that's one reason you guys, I don't know how many of y'all have heard of this case. This was a case that I didn't really know about until we started looking into Halloween cases. But in Canada, this is a famous case. It had widespread media attention, which he pointed out as a reason that he was convicted. The fact of how he did this, the catfishing aspect, the fact that he was arrested on Halloween, which is one of the reasons we're talking about it. The fact that it involved this sort of fake horror movie was something that really drew people. But his Dexter obsession has led to this being called the Dexter murders. And he was obsessed with Dexter, even though he will tell you that Dexter had nothing to do with the murder because it wasn't a murder. It was self-defense. And he maintains that to this day. And if you read any of the books on this, he still says this. But when the police searched his car, they found a novel about Dexter. In his home, police found burnt copies of many episodes of Dexter. By the way, I just love I just love that, you know, he loves Dexter, but he wasn't going to give Dexter money. He was going to burn those episodes. That's right. That's right. He notes in SK Confessions, I'd like to pay homage to the character referring to Dexter Morgan. Though he goes on to claim he's not copying him because, you know, he can't do that. He's just paying homage to him. He has compared himself to Dexter Morgan on Facebook, going so far as to create a profile under the name Dexter Morgan and sharing insights on episodes from Dexter's perspective. And you'll all be happy to know that one thing he said is that he has a television in his cell and during his incarceration he's been able to catch up on all the new episodes of Dexter and he now has seen them all so good for him how does that how does it make y'all feel that someone who was obsessed with Dexter carried out murders a la Dexter has continued to watch Dexter and learn new things that Dexter's doing in his new episodes and he's gonna come out when he's about 56 years old probably all he's been doing for the past 25 years is getting jacked I'm looking forward to that yeah yeah some people you know If you don't want to support the death penalty, that's fine. But some people should never get out. I feel like we should all be able to come together and and join hands and sing Kumbaya around, around the bonfire on the idea that some people should never be released from prison. And this is one of those people. And there's a 48 Hours episode you can watch on this, which features our good friend and the host of the Consult podcast, which should be on everybody's listening queue. My understanding is new episodes will be coming out soon, so get excited about that. But Julia Cowley was on 48 Hours, and she said a lot of things, but here's one thing she said about him. With many serial killers, it is the killing part that they enjoy. And once they've killed the person, they are done, not Mark Twitchell. I do think Mark Twitchell was using the filmmaking as an outlet to live out his fantasies, and it ultimately wasn't enough for him, and that is why his fantasies crossed into reality. I think Mark Twitchell believed that he is a very smart, very methodical, very logical, very level-headed, much like the character of Dexter Morgan, and so I think he got ideas in the show. I think he was drawn to the character because that is what he wanted to be, and I think that is so true. This person, you know, like I said... Dar Poutine calls him the hollow man because he has no core. There's nothing inside of him. And so all he can do is try and be something he admires. And unfortunately, instead of admiring like a great philanthropist, he decided he wanted to be a serial killer. And so that's what he ended up being. And speaking of serial killer, let's talk about those SK confessions, which, you know, only he really knows what SK stands for. But I think when we go through this document, you can see why it probably is something along the lines of a serial killer's confessions. It's 42 pages and it's only partially finished. There was more he was going to write. I dare to say, as we can tell from Jill's experience, he wasn't going to stop at Johnny. This was not going to stop until he was caught. And it outlined Johnny's murder, dismemberment, and Jill's attempted murder. Investigators were able to pull two deleted files on the laptop that they found in Mark's car, and they combined them together. It was titled SK Confessions, which the prosecutors argued stood for serial killer confessions. And the opening line was this, and it's chilling. The story is based on true events. The names and events were altered slightly to protect the guilty. This is the story of my progression into becoming a serial killer. It's just a script, though. It's just a script, and it was only slightly altered to protect the guilty. Slightly. 
<laughs> I mean, that's the other thing, right? I think Julia Cowley really hit it on the head when she said that he wanted to become a serial killer. So much so that it wasn't just the filmmaking. It wasn't just doing this over and over. He needed to document it. He wanted to see and smell and have all the tangible effects of what he was doing. And that this is part of that obsession. And the first page outlined Mark's decision to become a serial killer. Again, this matches kind of that profile that Julia was saying about him, that he fashions himself as an incredibly smart, bright person who can outsmart everyone else around him. And he loves that about himself so much so that he thinks it's incredibly important to even detail because everyone's going to want to know how does this person decide to become th someone like a serial killer. So he details this because Brett, for example, I haven't written down anywhere how I decided to become a lawyer. It's something that I am, but I don't I've never written down my decision making process as to why I've become a lawyer, because I think it's incredibly boring and no one would want to read it. <laughs> but here we have him going in detail about his own decision to become a serial killer. Maybe you have, Brett. I'm sorry if I called you a serial killer. No, Alice, I have not. <laughs> not. <laughs> sorry, I was just calling you out. OK, the second page outlined the method he would use targeting men through online dating sites. He initially intended to target only cheating husbands, which he described as, quote, taking out the trash, which if you watch Dexter, you know, it's a line that's also used by Dexter Morgan. And interestingly, remember, we said that Dexter Morgan, the TV show character, was doing what he thought was justified or justice killings. Whereas here, Mark tried to start out doing this. I'm going to get rid of the, you know, cheating husbands and everyone's going to thank me for it. But he feared that it would be harder to get away with these murders. And he ends up targeting just single men who lived alone. Ironically, Mark had been cheating on his wife with a former girlfriend at the time of Johnny's murder. So maybe he did an about face because he didn't want to target people like himself. The Westgate Confessions, it goes on to describe the garage where the kill room was set up and the black hockey mask, which was worn by the murderer. He does change the names in SK Confessions, but he doesn't try too hard. He only changes a few letters. He went on to write in explicit detail about the murder of Johnny Altinger and the struggle to hide his remains. The diary stopped short of revealing where Altinger's remains were, and so we only found what we found once he was willing to admit it to bolster his own defense. As you can imagine, this document was the subject of a lot of discussion in court, whether it should come in at all. The defense wanted it thrown out, saying it was far too prejudicial to come in, but the Crown argued that this was a clear confession to his crimes. It's his own statement. It's certainly relevant, and while it's prejudicial, it's not unfairly so. And ultimately, the judge did allow SK confessions in, with the exception of a few passages that they decided that just went too far. And that is how judges will often do it. They don't necessarily do wholesale. They'll sort of craft it to try and make it fair to both sides. And in fact, there was another document that the police had found on Twitchell's laptop called Profile of a Psychopath. And it was basically a discussion of his desire to become a killer and his belief that he was, in fact, a psychopath. This document was not admitted into evidence. It was found to be, while SK confessions seemed to be related directly to the murders, this was more about Mark. It was found to be too prejudicial, not relevant enough, and so it was kept out. But obviously, when you read it, it just makes it even more obvious that this was not a mistake. This was exactly what Mark intended to do to make his movie. And unfortunately, because there is truly no justice in the world, in April of 2022, it was announced that a movie would be made about Mark Twitchell. Producer David Permute has acquired the rights to The Devil's Cinema, which is the book about the murders, and has paired with Sam Hopkinson, who will write and direct the film. No release date has been announced as of yet, but I have no doubt that Mark Twitchell will watch the movie in his cell and will enjoy it quite a bit. I think what we've learned from this week's story, Brett, is that those of you who I'm looking at right now who are so obsessed with the gory and the horror 
it's interesting <laughs> whether you stay on this side of merely enjoying the entertainment or you so subsume yourself into it that you become what you enjoy watching. And I think, you know, when you look at it, I think Mark probably was headed down this path no matter what. I don't think Mark was going to find some positive role model to 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 admire. If Dexter hadn't been fictional, he would have just found he would have found a real serial killer. He was never going to do anything original and he was always going to do something violent and destructive. And at the end of the day, that's exactly what he did. And he's exactly where he belongs, which is prison. And I hope that when the parole board has its opportunity to consider his release, they will decline to do so. I don't know exactly how parole works in Canada. I don't know if there's some standard there you have to overcome to deny it. But I would think whatever that standard is, if you're ever going to deny parole, this is a guy to deny it on. I don't think he's suddenly going to turn his life around. Okay. So we're going to answer your question in a second. Before we do that, it is almost Halloween. Those of you who are looking, still looking for things to do. I've been thinking about this and I haven't given you any HP Lovecraft stuff to look at. You guys know I love HP Lovecraft. If you're a big fan of horror and you've never read HP Lovecraft, he was a writer in the twenties and the thirties. He basically hated everyone. So, you know, he hated you, no doubt, but he still wrote really good horror. <laughs> and in doing that, he released a lot of stuff that has become the basis for horror that has continued throughout the next 100 years or so. There was a show on HBO called Lovecraft Country that was pretty good. It was an introduction for a lot of people to, to what he did. But if you're looking to read his stuff, a few things I would recommend. His stuff can be very difficult to read. It can be very very what's the word i'm looking for there's a lot of purple prose which i love but a lot of people struggle with but there are some short stories that you can get into one of them is called dagon dagon is a great early story of his and it's one that is short but lays out sort of his sort of mythos his idea the other one is called the statement of randolph carter which is one of my favorites these are both stories that you can read in a very short period of time so i hope you guys will check it out we talked about music last time there's some more songs i wanted to suggest to you we talked about a serial killer today or at least someone who wanted to be a serial killer and it may or may not surprise you that there are actually a lot of songs out there about serial killers i don't know why certain people are attracted to certain things but there are some one of them is by Suf John Stevens, who is not the person you would expect to write a serial killer song, but wrote one of the best serial killer songs from his album, Come On, Hear the Illinois. Hear the Illinois. <laughs> yes, Come On, Hear the Illinois. It is John Wayne Gacy Jr. Bob Mata is probably a big fan of the song. But anyways, probably the best song ever written about a serial killer. I don't know that that's a high bar, but certainly up there. So know. it's an incredible song that I actually did a show on in when I was in a dance company at Yale. It was a chilling piece, as you can probably imagine. So I've actually heard that song probably no fewer than a thousand times. Wow. And everything about John Wayne Gacy's life is, unfortunately, that's one of the serial killers I know best because of this show that I did. So... Brett, that's all wow. I that's that's as much as I can connect with you there. But Sufjan <laughs> Sufjan Stevens is one of the most genius artists, I think, of our time. And that is a, one of the most haunting songs that I have listened to and could probably play and sing in my sleep. This is like the first time, Alice, that we've joined together and held hands over something horrific. It is a brilliant song. <laughs> and it I'm is so a brilliant it, If we're gonna I'm join hands over something, it would be Sufjan Stevens. <laughs> Well, I'll give you three more songs about serial killers in case that was too much of a loving, wonderful moment between Alice and me. One of them is Possum Kingdom by the Toadies. If you've never listened to the lyrics, listen to the lyrics <laughs> because it was a song that was huge in the 90s, huge alternate alternative song, pretty clearly about a serial killer. So check out that song. Another one, Song of Joy by Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds. Yeah, Nick Cave, pretty much everything Nick Cave sings is creepy. And that song is very, very creepy. And then there's Blitzen Trapper, Black River 
killer. Another great song. So all those songs are for your playlist at your Halloween party. You can add all those in to the ones we talked about yesterday. We started this off with a, not about a serial killer, but about a vampire. Those of you who are watching live, we listened to Bauhaus, Bela Lugosi is Dead, which is a great song. And another song about vampires, A Boy, A Girl, and A Graveyard, but which is a much more romantic song than Bela Lugosi is Dead. So those are my suggestions to you. Okay, Alice, do you want to answer a question tonight? Absolutely. Let's do it. Okay. Okay. Something something fun and happy, right? We need happy stuff at the end of these. We always need happy questions. So those of you with <sighs> five-star reviews or you haven't asked your five-star review question, you should ask some happy questions. Okay. So this, this person smartly asked two questions and one of them is for me and one of them is for you. And this is an appropriate Sort of like I've discussed this, but it says, Brett, what is your favorite horror novel and or short story? And the question for Alice is, my brother is starting law school this August. Do you have any advice for him? Shout out to my bro, Sammy. He listens too. And that's from Oliver Oddball. So hello, Sammy Oddball. It is great to have you along. Alice, why don't you go ahead and give your advice to Sammy about law school? And then I will say my favorite. Horror Why don't novel you just talk about story. horror while we're on the topic of horror? <laughs> well, okay. So favorite horror novel is hard because there are so many great ones. I mean, I would probably say the horror novel that I think affected me the most because I read it when I was relatively young was The Shining by Stephen King. You know, I picked up that book and read it when I was much younger than I should have been. And it would just blew me away. I mean, still the scariest thing I've ever read. You know, so much of horror is about when you see it because horror movies are a lot like that too. The horror movies you watch when you're 12 with your friends are the scariest thing you've ever seen. And then when you watch them again with your 40, you're like, I don't know. Okay, I've never read The Shining again. Love the movie. Really all the adaptations of the movie. But the book is really good. So that one, that one is very, very high on my list of favorite horror novels. I think it's Stephen King's best book. That's probably controversial, but I really do. I just think it's great. And, and I would check that out. Short story is tough. I mean, I would probably say The Call of Cthulhu because that's affected me more than anything. I mean, it's just such a brilliant, brilliant story. Though, At the Mountains of Madness is a tremendous story. These are both H.P. Lovecraft, obviously. It's a tremendous story. It's probably a little bit more mature than The Call of Cthulhu. But The Call of Cthulhu is great. Though, the one I always recommend is The Statement of Randolph Carter because it's much shorter. And so you can really enjoy that. There's so much good short horror out there though i mean i'll give you a classic for those of you who don't like horror i'll give you some gothic southern gothic if you've never read a rose for emily by faulkner check it out a rose for emily is it is not horror in any of the traditional sense but when you finish with it you will see the southern gothic horror that defined sort of faulkner's best work so that that one i will suggest Rose for Emily. Okay, so I'm going to take a non-traditional answer to advice for law students in general. And congratulations, Sammy. And I think this applies to everybody, no matter what you do. And I think our listeners actually will have already accomplished this. And that is just because you're going to law school or fill in the blank with whatever you're doing next doesn't mean you have to park the rest of your personality or the other parts of yourself for in order for you to become a lawyer. So a lot of people say when you go to law school, you need to be single minded. You know, you have no more hobbies. You don't do anything except go to law school and learn the rules of evidence and learn, you know, contract law and property law, whatnot. I think maybe if you've learned anything from me and Brett, it's that we did a lot of other things and law school to remember the different aspects of ourselves. And then here's why I think it's important for you as a law student, because law school can give you tunnel vision and everyone else is going to give you pressure to be tunnel vision. All you do is law and there's nothing else in your life that's important. If you like theater, that's a waste of time. If you like music, that's a waste of time because you should be taking that time to study. I think that's a really wrong way to approach life and certainly a wrong way to approach law because a good lawyer is one who has who is well-rounded and able to make connections in every part of their lives. The art, the music, the you know, what have you. That is the best kind of lawyer because a lawyer is one that goes out into the world and deals with real life conflicts. 
Real life conflicts don't fit into clean buckets. They're all over the place. And it's your job as a good lawyer to be able to see connections that the rest of the world can't see. That's what makes a great lawyer rather than just a good lawyer who can memorize codes and rules and regulations. So my advice to you would be that you sound like you probably have just a rich life. Don't leave that behind just because you're going to law school. It's a part of you. It's what's going to make you an exciting law student and an ultimately an exciting lawyer. And you can lead a very full life, you know, no matter which profession you go into. So yeah, good luck. Beautiful advice. I have nothing to add to that. Do have one more thing to say about horror, though. (laughs) At some earlier point, I recommended House of Leaves to those of you to read. And that is basically the most evil thing I could do. And I and I do it intentionally. And I've had the same experience now that I've had before when I recommend that book to people. So when I was in, I believe, law school, I had read House of Leaves and I recommended it to someone. And a few days later, there was a knock on my dorm door and I opened it and the person was standing there and they looked utterly bedraggled that they hadn't slept in days. And they were like, why did you recommend this book to me? (laughs) And I didn't really have any words for them, but they just sort of stumbled away back to their room where hopefully they got some sleep. And at least one of you took me up on reading House of Leaves and had a very similar reaction to me on email that the book had really messed with you in a way that you'd never experienced before. And that is the thing about House of Leaves. You know, you asked me what the best horror novel is. I can't say that House of Leaves is the best novel or horror novel I've ever read. But if you read House of Leaves and you let House of Leaves get into your head, there is no book that will affect you more than House of Leaves. House of Leaves is like a book out of a horror story. It is a book that somehow has been designed perfectly to get into your mind and mess with you. And it does at a very deep level. So if you can get into it and get through it, it will mess with you and you will never forget it. So that's my that's my recommendation once again of House of Leaves. Well, Brett, we're circling up on like eight straight days of recording and whatnot. Are we going to wrap up wrap it up today at all? (laughs) We're wrapping it up. We're all done, I'm Alice. so tired. We're all I'm done. so tired. <laughs> we're all done. All right, guys. All right. We're all done. We got one more to go. One more Halloween episode, and that's all we got. Uh, and then, and then 20% of you will be Christmas back. Christmas is around the corner. Exactly. Christmas is, is <laughs> and, and we'll start talking about, I guess, not creepy things, you know, like murder and mayhem. I mean, we've talked about four cases. They all involved murder and mayhem up to this point. This has been... The most true crime of all our Octobers. I personally am disappointed in us, and I hope you're disappointed in us too. This is been straight done true crime, paranormal. But next week, I, Brett, I, I just want to say, are you like you know, just are you are you changing who you are? Maybe I am because you just got Maybe straight to the like pressure horror has got to me exactly. The criticism <laughs> has finally changed who I am. But next week, <laughs> never. Next week, we'll be back with one of my absolute favorite paranormal events stories ever told one of the most famous paranormal events in history one that people still wonder about to this very day about exactly what happened what it means what it means for the future and what it means if you happen to encounter a strange being who may portend disaster but until then i'm brett and i'm alice and we are the prosecutors. Um, I just want to thank all of you at CrimeCon who gave me gummy bears because I'm pretty Mm. sure I ate all of them, (laughs) which is like way too much sugar consumption for this short of time. But you know when you're really tired and all you want to do is snack? That's what I've been doing the past couple of days, just eat gummy bears. So thank you for that, everybody. <laughs> yeah. I can't remember who it was who was like, if you don't take candy from strangers, I don't understand. And I was like, 
Oh, I didn't I even did. think about that. I just took gummy bears. I totally ignored our first <laughs> Halloween episode. Learned nothing from it. <laughs> nothing. I didn't even think about it before I <laughs> ate all of, the, all of the candy that was given to me. them all. I do love sour worms. I love I corn love dogs. Them all. Corn dogs are great. You know what? I love I think... mustard on corn dogs. I like I like ketchup on hot dogs, as we know, from my deepest, darkest confessions. But when it comes to corn dogs, just give me like a give me a corn dog and a thing of mustard. You know why that? And I'm just gonna like why <laughs> why corn sorry. dogs are good I'm with really mustard sorry. or Yeah, because mustard and why why you like ketchup with hot dogs? Because hot dogs salty with the sweetness of ketchups. Mustard spicy or the opposite bitter, whatever you want to call it, and the sweetness of the cornbread. Oh, our that makes complex so much tastes. Sense. Our complex tastes. Else, maybe we should start a food Take podcast. Take that, process cook- cookies. Food process cook- cookies. podcast. True crime on Pluto TV. Unravel the mysteries with Forensic Files and 48 Hours. Investigate crimes with Dateline 24 7 and Unsolved Mysteries. With thousands of free crime movies and TV shows, Pluto TV is the true home of crime. Download the Pluto TV app on all your favorite devices and start streaming.